Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of the Bitch Mob ENT Podcast, the best sports podcast in New Jersey. How you fellas doing tonight? Doing good. Lots to talk about. A lot happened since the last time we talked to the to the people. Hey, as y'all see on the screen, we got the big three. We put our best lineup out tonight. Fourth member. <laughs> Yo, this, Miles don't even flip when you sell stuff like that, yo. <laughs> this is the best lineup that we have out right now. The plus minus for this big three lineup is at 924. Oh we have a one of the highest efficiency ratings when this big three is on the court. So this is the lineup that we went with for tonight. Y'all know the vibes. We are not trying to just be here. For a short time you feel me we here for a good time and a long time so we need you to hit that subscribe button share like rate us give us five star review all that good stuff on today's episode what you can expect for tonight we're gonna talk kirk cousins of course we're gonna talk free agency we're gonna talk some of these big trades that happen we're gonna talk about lebron is he going to win a ring again because the man said he want the max and a bunch of more topics Starting off with free agency, though, Kirk Cousins said this before he signed that first big contract. They asked him about free agency. He said every player looks forward to free agency. If you Kirk Cousins, yeah, the money he's been getting, you looking forward to free agency. Some of the big free agent signings so far, Kirk. Falcons, four years, 180. Saquon Barkley to the Eagles, three years, 37 and a half. We got Hollywood Brown as a chief. Dalton Soaps, he starts. He's back with the Texans. Tyron Smith went to the Jets. Patrick Queen went to the Steelers. Jalen Johnson re-signed with the Bears. Joe Flacco is a Colt. Austin Eckler is a commander. Linder Floyd is with the 49ers on a two-year, $20 million contract. Derrick Henry signed with the Ravens two years, sixteen million. For ya, what has been your top three storylines, top three signings, trades so far of the NFL offseason? I mean, maybe the like the Cowboys haven't done anything. They've been real quiet. Um, <laughs> they let Tony Pollard walk. Uh, I, heard, I even heard talks that they might even think about bringing back Zeke. So. I'm not sure what the direction is for this team. I know maybe they're not trying to spend big money because they've got some extensions looming, like Michael Parsons is going to ask for the bag. Dak, he's definitely not taking any team-friendly discounts. So in that aspect, maybe that's what Jerry Jones is being told to do because I know for him, he's always about making a splash. He's always about you know signing the, the big fish, whether that's like Stephon Gilmore, Terrell Owens in the past, like he's all, always about going big. And after the cl- collapse of this season where they won the division, they had home field advantage and they got smoked by the Packers, you would have thought that they'd be a little more aggressive defensively, you know, added a couple more pieces offensively. Um, like they lost their left tackle. They're all pro who's been here for like a decade, probably a Hall of Famer. So. They've got some some stuff to do at this point. Um, I don't know if they can fix everything, but uh, we'll see. And then, like the Falcons, I would say, are winners because they've had such poor quarterback play the last two years that, I mean, even Kirk Cousins, who only has one playoff win in his career, he's head and shoulders above everybody else that they've had since maybe Matt Ryan a couple years ago. So that automatically makes B. John Robinson – a better player, Kyle Pitts, Drake London. Like, yeah. This is going to be a team that's going to be dangerous in that NFC South. Do I think they're threats in the playoffs? Maybe not, but, I mean, they've got to sell a product. And the owner's got to be able to tell the season ticket holders that, like, we're trying, we're doing this. And you kind of do that with Kirk Cousins, although, I mean, that guy's the greatest bag getter in football history. <laughs> Because there's never been a big bag that he hasn't gotten, even with his play. Even coming off a, a, a torn Achilles, he's still able to get a, a bag. So 
Falcons are winners. Um, they should be able to win the division next year. I see the Saints kind of declining. Panthers, they are where they are. So with that, yeah. that obviously is a good good point. And like you said, Kirk Cousins, hey, man, I need his agent. Anytime I want to get some bread, I'm going to have to have Kirk Cousins agents. Four years, 180 mil, coming off an Achilles. And he's, what, 36 years old? So at 40 years old, that man is going to be getting a bag. Greg, what has been some of the biggest storylines for you? Any other trades? I, I'm pretty sure you're going to mention something that happened for the Giants, you know, a part of your biggest storyline. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's my – I mean, um, I think the Kirk Cousins one is huge for sure, and that was one I would have said if I had answered first. But um, I think the Saquon signing is, is a big one. I mean, and, and not because I think that – not because I think that the Eagles are geniuses for doing it. I, I actually think what the reason why it stood out to me is because I didn't understand it. I didn't understand signing an aging running back to a, a sizable contract. Um, and I didn't understand. And, and Fortina historically doesn't invest in the running back position. And I really don't get it from the standpoint of your defense was the problem last year. It wasn't like offensively you guys struggled. And your running game certainly, certainly didn't struggle. Um, last year so I, I really don't understand you know the addition you got it you didn't add to the weakness of your team you just you just made a strength even stronger uh, maybe they're going to try to play keep away a bit more from teams and run the ball more and if that's the logic then sure it'll be effective and and, and Saquon makes them better and he's gonna have success there um and probably a lot of it as long as he stays healthy but I just didn't really get it um it's it's, it's off the beaten path for a team like the Eagles to do that and especially a team that's analytics driven and you know they're like a bit they're, they're more pioneers in the league in terms of the way they view the game and um they're the, the way they use analytics to make decisions with the roster and things like that so i thought that was interesting but i do think it'll be effective and obviously they're going to be they're going to be a great offense they're going to put up a ton of points and it, it makes jalen hurts life a lot easier because you can't really stack the box with him out there with take one out there so he'll be able to run the ball uh the read option will be great um as well to work short well and obviously the touch push they run and as we're we gonna call i like the, the fact they call we call it that i think the name is really demeaning and it just fits philadelphia so the touch the touch push uh, will be a bit more effective because you have saquon back there uh what is eight thousand pound thighs or whatever so that should be that should be interesting to watch but i, I think um you know the outrage around saquon leaving in that situation um i i, I don't feel that way I don't, I don't feel that way towards Saquon. I think Saquon did what was best for him, and there's nothing wrong with what he did at all. The Giants didn't want him back. The Giants made a smart business decision not bringing him back. Uh, that was the right decision. You can't build your football team around your running back. You can't have a roster where the best player on your football team is the running back. You're not going to win anything. You're not, you're not going to win. Uh, you're not going to have success in the playoffs. And so I thought that they made the right decision letting him walk. And, you know, outside of just that, I think the big part, the big thing that Saquon did that, really led to a lot of the vitriol online you saw from giants fans and this was confusing to me i just didn't understand why he didn't thank the fans at any point in new york um you know usually when team when, when players leave they make posts about the fans and they thank the fans even if it's just a short thing even if they don't really mean it they thank the fans and i just i was really confused and he i saw he admitted that he he handled it poorly but in real time when i saw it he just kind of posted a graphic of him wearing an eagles jersey I was like, let's go. And I'm just like, it's good to be excited. I'm expecting like the follow up post to be about Giants fans and thanking the Giants. And he just never did that. And I think part of the reason why he didn't do it is because his feelings were hurt. I think he wanted to be a Giant for the rest of his life. I think he really meant that. And I think he was really hurt that the Giants didn't make him an offer. That the Giants never made him an offer and during this free agency process. And that it was clear that they were set on never, ever in re signing him. Um, and I, I know as a player, it must be hard because you are the best player on the team and you're the heartbeat of the team, but you're the heartbeat on the of, of a team that didn't accomplish anything, right? And that to no fault of your own, you know what I mean? It's not his fault. If anything, it's the, it's the, just the Giants front office fault, 100%, right? The previous front offices that brought him in and put rosters around him. So I understand his frustration, right, from his, from his you know, standpoint, but... You, you can't you really just can't do that like you can't build a winner and have your running back be your best player by far it's just it's just tough 
Um, and I know he's, you know, you can argue that Dexter Lawrence is as good as he is or whatever, but the point is your quarterback has to be as good or, or better than your running back and should be better um, considerably. So it is a tough call. It's a tough call. And um, I, I don't, I don't hold it against Saquon. I just, I just thought I should address that because I'm sure, you know, there are Giants fans who listen to the podcast who probably felt some kind of way. And, and I don't feel any kind of way about it. I thought it was the right decision. you got a clear house of all the Dave Gettleman people and move forward. Uh, and Daniel Jones is next. He'll be gone next. And I'm looking forward to it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was a big one. I thought the Brian Burns trade was obviously great. Um, I, I thought he was being misused and mis, misused out there. And, and uh, for Carolina, just watching all his clips and watching some of the film that's circling on t- Twitter, uh, they have been dropping back in the coverage a lot. And I thought that because the Panthers were losing a lot, they were getting run against a lot. So he's not getting a lot of pass rush opportunities. And I think the numbers bear it out. Like, I think, you know, T.J. Watt gets about 550 to 600 pass rush attempts every single year. And Brian Burns, I believe, last year only had like 380 pass rush attempts and had nine sacks. So when you, when you watch the film, like, he flies. I mean, the Giants haven't had a pass rusher like that of that quality in so long. I mean, it, it, I mean, you got to go back to talk and OCU Manura and, and Michael Strahan and, and all them boys, right? All them guys, right? To really think back to when the Giants had a dominant pass rusher like that. And the idea that we have a, a D line of Dexter Lawrence, Brian Burns, um, and, and um, Kayvon Thibodeau, you're in a really, really good place from that perspective. That's the strength of your football team. Uh, with O'Kara K back there, the middle linebacker, and my, I mean, Fadden, who was ascending, was an ascending player. So I like what they did defensively. And I thought that the, to what they traded for him, nothing. It was basically nothing. I mean, the Rams offered two first round picks the year before, and they turned that down. So clearly, other teams, and Les, and, um, Les Needs a very smart, very, very smart GM over there in LA. So, you know, Clearly, other teams were waiting for this guy to break free out of Carolina and think he can be a superstar player. And, and the fact that the Giants have him is very, very exciting. Um, it'll be more exciting when the Giants finally get a quarterback, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, but yeah, I think that was another big move. I trying to think of other ones. I, I love that. I love Derrick Henry to the Ravens. I think that, that that's a really great signing for them. It, it's going to be really tough to stop that run game throughout the year with him and Lamar doing read option plays um, and just the power he brings to the offense. Derrick Henry has been productive everywhere he's ever been. He's never stopped being a, a, a thousand yard to 1500 yard rusher, sometimes even 2000 yard. I mean, he's just that good. And he's in an age gracefully because he's such a big guy, you know, that he doesn't take punishment the same way that other running backs do. So I love that move for them. A high value signing and it makes a strength even stronger. Same similar to the Eagles strength even stronger on that football team, but you got them at a better price, which is awesome. So I'm really looking forward um, to watching him play over there and seeing how he does. But I think that team's going to be really, really good again. And it's going to come down to, you know, obviously Lamar winked in the pocket in the playoffs, but they'll be a great team all throughout the year with that addition too. So those are a couple that stood out, just a couple. There's a lot of them, but I think those are a couple. Those are our high, high tier ones for me. Yeah, to your point, mentioning some other ones that happened, some trades. Jerry Judy got traded to the Browns, to the Broncos, I mean. He got traded to the Broncos. Uh, Justin Fields to the Steelers. Russell Wilson signed with the Steelers. Kenny Pickett got traded from the Steelers. So the Steelers made some changes in that quarterback room. You mentioned Lamar. You mentioned the Derrick Henry signing. To the point of the Steelers needing to do this, right? So the quarterback room is Justin Fields now, Russell Wilson. 2018 is the last time that the Pittsburgh Steelers had a top 10 finish in passing offense. That was the year with 36-year-old Big Ben, 5,121 yards passing, 34 touchdowns, and 16 interceptions. That was the last time that they had a top 10 finish. That year, they was number two. Outside of that, every year after that, they were 19 and below. How much better are the Steelers now, being that they have their quarterback now and possibly the quarterback of the future with these two acquisitions? Light years better than they were last year. Like, 
Kenny Pickett was a quarterback who couldn't push the ball down the field. Maybe he could, but he just didn't feel like he should, or you could blame it on Matt Canada and all that you want, but I'm sure he, most of his play calls were because he didn't believe in this quarterback being able to make plays downfield. So he tried to call a lot of shorter throws and all that. But when you have, you know, George Pickens, one of the most talented receivers in the NFL, if given a chance, that's where he thrives is downfield. And now you bring in Russell Wilson, who always been a really good deep ball thrower. So this will help stretch the field a little bit. I know they did trade Deontay Johnson, so that's kind of a hit to the receiving core. But uh, free agency's not done yet. You still have the draft to address some of those issues. But you're bringing in a veteran who's won before, who's probably pissed off and a little motivated to, you know, make some plays out here to show, like, I still got some game. Like, that whole year, those last two years in Denver, with Hackett and then with Sean Payton, it's got a way on you. Like, I don't think that he played all that bad last year, but when you're not winning, of course, the quarterback's going to take the blame. And that's what they did. They tried to do that. So I think coming over to Pittsburgh, where he's got Mike Tomlin on his side, who, I mean, everybody knows Mike Tomlin. He's like, he's like the cool guy in the barbershop. He'll talk to everybody. He'll want to, like, you know, make friends with everybody. And, he wants to win. He has a program. And I feel like Russ fits that timeline pretty well, for what they're trying to do, because they won nine games last year with out a starting quarterback, basically, because Pickett's a backup. Rudolph is borderline backup slash practice squad material. So I think this team's going to be a lot better. And then, I mean, you can gamble with Justin Fields. Uh, he, I think he's like almost insurance at this point. I don't know if they actually see him as a, the future quarterback after Russ. Who knows? If Russ plays lights out, he'll probably sign an extension. This is kind of similar to uh, Baker Mayfield with Tampa Bay last year where he had that one-year deal and played his ass off and got a, a new contract. So um, it should be an interesting storyline to see as the season goes on because if they're not winning, Kind of similar to this year, I think they might sit him and try to see what they have in Justin Fields because the kid is talented. It's just he was in a terrible spot in Chicago that did him no favors. They kind of sabotaged his career to start. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I don't know if you told me we're going to take this away, but I, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine today about quarterback play, young quarterbacks in the league, and how much how much we should be blaming bad situations on their play, uh, or yeah, blaming that blaming the bad situations they're in uh, for their play versus you know the play of the quarterback. And Justin Fields came up, and while I understand that the Chicago Bears haven't done a great job protecting him with the, with the whole line, they haven't been that bad, but they haven't done a great job with you know putting a bunch of weapons around them. They got him DJ Moore. Um, and they also traded for Claypool, which just didn't work out. They made attempts. I think the thing with Justin Fields that really concerns me is that he doesn't make the right play from the pocket even 70 to 60% of the time. You know what I mean? I just take what defense gives you. Like, oh, they're in cover too. I'm just going to take this, this little pass right here. Like, I'm going to take this little, you know, short stick route right here. Like, just making the simple play over and over and over again, right? And making teams pay, making that, those plays. And I think that's a processing problem. I, I saw a stat yesterday on ESPN late night that he he and Russell Wilson actually lead the, lead the NFL in most sacks taken in the last couple of years. That they're right there. Um, and, you know, that's a processing problem. The ball's not getting out on time, you know, and that's why Sean Payton was losing it on Russell Wilson over there because he's all about timing and rhythm and you have Drew Brees, you just use the ball getting to where it needs to go on time and making the defense pay for whatever the hole is in, their, in that particular defense or that look they're giving you. And that's a, Justin Fields is so similar to Russell Wilson in that way. The reason why I'm a little worried about this move is while it's a great value sign, you got it, you know, you traded nothing for him, you know, how, you know, I don't know who's in Pittsburgh right now that's going to help him develop into the guy that can be 
a great processor of defenses and make the right decisions over and over again. We already know that Justin Fields can make the extraordinary play. But what makes a great quarterback a great quarterback like Patrick Mahomes is that, and the thing people don't talk about with Mahomes is we all we always look at the left-handed passes, the deep, you know, the the crazy scrambles, all that stuff. But it's about beating a team from the pocket over and over and over again and making the right decision, putting the ball at the right place at the right time. And I feel like Mahomes doesn't get enough credit for how good he is at that. He's surgical in, in a way that Brady was. It's like it's it's very comparable. But then he has the amazing aspect of a game where he can just make game-breaking plays. You know what I mean? And just, you know, freestyle and make something crazy happen too. You got to have a little bit of both. You got to be able to hit the home runs, but hit the singles too. And I feel like Justin Fields doesn't hit singles at all. And I've seen some plays. I mean, I remember seeing the, I went, was it the first play of the year last year? A bubble screen he threw to uh, DJ Moore where he threw it at his feet. He picked the ball off the ground and still housed it because it was a well, it was well designed play. So he just took the, you know, took the blocks and DJ Moore is a great player, but you threw it at his feet. You know, a pass you threw out, you know, maybe four, you threw it to your left. It didn't even have to travel that far. And so those are my concerns with him, just the accuracy and the ability to process the process, just basic defensive principles that teams are running and make the right decisions over and over again. That makes a great quarterback a great quarterback. And so I have my concerns about him long term because of that. And I think that's the reason why you saw the Bears run the ball so much that last year when he was but when he was behind center, they ran the ball a ton, right? It was like Tyson Bajan took over. And they what it's won games with him just you know handing the ball off, and then Fields came back came back, and there was basically no difference at all. They just kept running the football. So I'm very interested to see what they do in in Pittsburgh. Obviously, you can run the ball a lot and you know lie on your defense, and he's better than Pickett. He is because he'll push the ball downfield, and make some of those wild plays that Pickett can't even dream of making with those small hands. But I just I just have my concerns about about Fields long term as a as a great quarterback and a guy you can extend and extend his contract and be comfortable with as a franchise quarterback because of the fact that you don't process defense that's all that's all i think it's interesting though too that um he only went for like a six-round pick it was almost like here take him like mm -hmm. already, we've already moved on and everybody's saying no right. to what we want we asked for us i don't even know if they even started with a first probably they were like, hell no, and hung up the phone. But if they started with a second, they're like, nah, that's too heavy. I'm sure for the, the Eagles, they asked for like a fourth or something. They're like, for a backup? I'm not doing that. You could just take a quarterback and a draft, and you'd have less of a headache, and there'd be less questions. It's almost like the combo of bringing in Cam Newton all those years, like a couple years ago, and, and it's like he'd be a distraction. Like Justin Fields is kind of a distraction to any of these teams that – are just looking for a backup because he's always going to be asked the questions about starting and being the guy and if he should be in there and all this stuff. So at least they, they went ahead and said, no, he's going to be the backup. There's no competition. Like he's going to back up Russell Wilson and that's that. So they kind of nipped this in the bud before training camp because you can't do this. You got to let this kid kind of sit and watch. And he didn't, he never developed. That's the thing. He never, was given the chance to develop. He was never given the chance to just sit and watch. That's the thing. These guys are taken so high in the draft. You, they're put. There's pressure on them once they're picked to play right away. Bryce Young, maybe he should have sat, but because he's the no, number one overall pick, you put him in there went too soon. And you look at the the Panthers last year when Bryce Young was hurt. Andy Dalton's in there. Offense looked so much better. So I feel like he could have learned from sitting. And Justin Fields never got that chance because the Bears, out for whatever reason, thought like, all right, this guy is pro ready. I mean, for every CJ Stroud, you got a Justin Fields. Like not everybody's gonna be ready to start right away. So um, maybe he gets another chance somewhere else. Maybe it's in Pittsburgh, but he shouldn't play this year. Like there's no way you can play him this year. And I hope for his career, this helps him. It, like. Because this doesn't have to be the end. I mean, everybody's looking at it like it's the end because they want him to be a backup. They want – all these teams only wanted him to be a backup. But, like, this could be something that projects him to a longer career. Because, like, who was it? Vince Young had a great career at Texas. Rookie of the year, looked promising. Injuries happened, then he just didn't play well. 
and fizzled out. Does he want to be like that, or does he want to kind of take the – I don't want even want to say Doug Flutie, uh, Warren Moon, right, where it's you've got to kind of build your way up into being like a starting quarterback in the league. Because for some reason, everybody wants the gratification of their pick ASAP. And sometimes it can't be that way. It, 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 to Miles, I'll say this too because I feel like – Y'all not good. the people who listen to this podcast aren't gonna get this on first take tomorrow morning when they're talking about it. You ain't gonna get this. They're never gonna say what I'm about to say right now. And, and what I'm gonna tell you right now is I think the reason why um, this the, this 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 mentality and mindset around getting the most out of your draft pick if they're a quarterback, your first round quarterback or second round quarterback or whatever early is because of the rookie scale co- of contracts and how they work. You're on a time. You're on a clock right away. For these guys to be good, I think the reason why Justin Fields, um, you know, was was traded for so little is because he's at the end of that rookie scale contract. So you have to make a decision on his contract long term, or right? you're gonna have to pay him. So you're really only trading for a rental if you think about it. I, you know, I'm not sure if he's in his fifth year option or not at this point. I'm not. I'm not even sure if he was picked up or not. But I know that he's at the end, and so teams got critical of his flaws, the flaws I just spoke about for a while. I'm on here. And I think that's why he didn't go for much. And I think that's the issue that they had. So you don't have, I think if he was in his second year of his rookie scale contract, a team would take, would trade more for him and be more willing to take him on because you have longer to develop him while he's still cheap and you could still build your team and spend money other places. You know what I mean? It's hard now with the cap being where it, where it is, even though it's rising to, you know, pay a quarterback big dollars and obviously have a good football team around them. That's why, which is, which is why Pat Mahomes restructured his contract so they can go get Hollywood Brown. It's just, it's, it's all, it's all correlated. Right. Um, so I just feel like, you know, when you talk about the Justin Fields situation, it's nuanced because he, at the end of that rookie scale deal, he won't be cheap anymore if you're going to keep him, right? And or and he has Dave Mulgetta as a GM, as a, an agent. So he's going to get, you know, he's going to get something representative of, of a good contract. He's going to get something. That's just, that guy's a good agent. Um, so you just take all those things into account. And that's why he went for so little, ultimately. But I did hear also that he had options and other teams were offering a little bit more. And they gave him the option to choose where he wanted to go, uh, which tells you how much he thinks of Russell Wilson, by the way, that he chose to go there. So, um, yeah, I think it's interesting, but. I think the rookie rookie skill contract thing is is really really an interesting conversation to have about team building in the NFL and the philosophies of teams how they want to go move forward and also why if you are a Giants fan hanging on to the the dream that Daniel Jones will be here past next year the Brian Byrne extension they just gave him fifty whatever it is for forty million dollars a year thirty whatever thirty million whatever that tells you that their quarterback's not going to be here that's not a trade you make if you have a quarterback you plan on paying. Forty million dollars a year in the future. So just you know, team building stuff. It seems nerdy, but it's 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 the NFL. You should get in tune with it. You don't want to know what you're talking about. And to know why your team is doing what they're doing. Brian Burns, five right. years, one fifty. So that's thirty million per year right there for Brian Burns. So that tells you, like he said, everything that you need to know concerning that. And I did find that interesting too. Justin Fields chose the Steelers. That's where he wanted to mm-hmm. go. Miles talked about mm-hmm. it that, hey, he should sit for the year. But in your opinion, how many games will Russell Wilson play before they put him fields? I say <laughs> – I mean, this team can still win. Like, they won with Kenny Pickett. So, it's not like you bring in Russell Wilson and all of a sudden they're, like, a worse team. Like I feel like they're a better team now than they were a month ago. Um, so I think, if if anything, if they're out of playoff contention in December, maybe that's when you bring in Fields to see, you give them a couple games to see, like, all right, is there something there? Is this something we should, you know, pursue after this year? Because, one, I don't know if they even picked up the, the option, but that would mean that he'd have to sign an extension if they didn't. So. I mean, what would make me think, unless he's going to take a one-year deal. Um, but, no, I, I just – honestly, I'm going to say he's not going to play at all this year, unless there's an injury. To your point, before you go, Greg, it's been reported that they are supposed to be working on a longer-term contract throughout the season. Hopefully they're saying before mm-hmm. the beginning of the regular season. So 
this is going to be interesting. Fields is going to have to get a contract and get paid. And they talking about giving two, three years to Russell Wilson. That's a, that's a rumor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that Fields are going to play this year. I'm, I'm not as optimistic in Russell Wilson, um, to be honest with you. I think that they're going to require him at some point to win a game from the pocket. And I don't think he was bad last year, but if we're being honest, the numbers don't tell the story. It's lazy. I don't do it in basketball. I'm not going to do it in football where I lean on the numbers to support, you know, the play of a player when I watched him play. He, the, the eye test tells you he's, he's not the same player. Wilson's not as good as he once was. And so um, I think Fields will get an opportunity to play this year. And if you know, it's very calculated what the Bears did. The sixth round pick they gave up will actually be a fourth round pick if he plays over 51% of the team's quarterback snaps. It actually changes. That's actually what I read from, I don't even know who reported it, but I'm sure you can find it out there. So um, they wouldn't have done that if they didn't think there was a chance that this guy could potentially, could potentially play right this year. And I, I think that tells you how much they think of Russell Wilson as well, right? And how what the thoughts around, of Russell Wilson are around the league. So I do think he's going to play this year. I would say he'll play maybe around week eight, week nine, week 10, that area. I think he'll get an opportunity to play a bit, bit this year. I don't think he goes there if he doesn't and if if he doesn't have an inclination to believe that he would get a chance to play this year. We ain't talking about Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett wouldn't play because we know that we ain't got nothing better behind him. All right, but you know, with this guy with Fields, we know he can play, and I think he's gonna get an opportunity. He'll get to learn. He'll get an opportunity. It's kind of like think about it how like if you take a first round a first round pick quarterback and you have a established veteran in place. You know, at some point, we all know that guy's going to get an opportunity to play. And I just think if, if Russell Wilson goes up there and balls and he plays great, awesome, happy for him, happy for him. But I just don't see it. I don't see it, like, long term. I think he may have a couple of good moments, but a couple of bad ones, too. And I think you're going to see the guy get an opportunity to get out there a bit this year. But we'll see. Could be wrong. Very point. interesting quarterback situation. To your point, Russell Wilson last year. 3,070 yards, 26 touchdowns, only eight interceptions. And mm. to be on top of that, he had four game-winning comeback wins last year, which was a part of the top mm. two or three, I believe. So if you look at that on mm. paper, you're like, oh, man, Russell Wilson, why did he get traded? He played well last mm. year if you're just looking on paper. But if you watch some of those games – Russ did not look his best. It's not just on Russ. It's Sean Payton also. But don't get it confused looking just at the numbers and saying, oh, nah, Russ, he still got it. He's going to go get a Super Bowl in Pittsburgh. If they get one, it's not going to be because of Russ. It's Mike Tomlin and the rest of that squad, the rest of that roster, which is a pretty good roster. And I'm excited because next year, that division, already the hardest division in the league. Now you add Russell Wilson to the Steelers. The Ravens add Derrick Henry. The Bengals got a couple pieces. Yeah, and the Browns coming back with Deshaun Watson, hopefully, and it's not Deshaun Cosby. That's going to be a really competitive, really competitive uh, division right there. Speaking of competitive divisions, AFC East has not been one of those. The New England Patriots still to this day has the record for the most consecutive titles in a division 11 straight afc east titles they have a total of 17 or 18 closest person to them is the chiefs at eight we are doing franchise mode new york jets just to give a little backdrop so far the jets this all season they signed tyrod taylor he just switches locker rooms morgan moses tyron smith john simpson that's all on the offensive side they re-signed greg zerlin thomas morstead Javon Kinlaw on the defensive line, Leaky Futu on the defensive line. So far, that's been what they've done with the signing of Isaiah Oliver also at cornerback. Now, the Jets have not been in the playoffs for a little bit. Whoever wants to go. <laughs> What's a little bit? <laughs> no, it's been like when was the last time? 13 years, maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Hey man, Miles, you can start. That's off. a rough one. Let me know, Miles. You can start <laughs> off. What are the three things that the Jets need to do to be in playoff contention again? 
Uh, well, we've got to keep Aaron Rodgers upright. I mean, that was the biggest thing, biggest downfall this past season was, you know, right off the bat, it felt like he was under pressure. I think that's all he ever knew this past year was pressure. Even in the preseason, uh, it was an issue. But they did a lot to kind of fix those issues. I mean, we got uh, Elijah Vera Tucker coming back off of injury. He'll be at right guard. We got Morgan Moses who was one of the best right tackles in football last year. And then we bring in the all pro Tyron Smith to, you know, fill out the left side along with uh, the left guard that we signed. So I think the line is shaping up nicely. I mean, the only thing is we need to get some depth behind them. So maybe we sign like a Bakhtiari uh, as a third tackle just in case. Cause I mean, Tyron Smith's missed game. So it's always, it's a gamble, you know, we are not able to get a caliber of player like this for the, the price that we paid, if not for all the injuries. So, I mean, it's you know a blessing, but also you got to be nervous a little bit. Um, we need more weapons. Uh, we can't roll with Lazard as the number two. And Garrett Wilson is a stud. I mean, 2,000-yard seasons to start his career. Clearly, I mean, if we had Aaron Rodgers, he would have gone crazy this past year. But – you know, playing with uh, Zach Wilson and, and company didn't really help that. And I think the, the other receivers didn't help him either. So he was getting double teamed a little more than we would have liked. So maybe they address it at number 10, uh, maybe in free agency or trade, like T. Higgins is still out there. Let's see if they go after somebody like that. Or I know they're meeting Mike Williams on Monday. And he might come on like a one-year deal, um, incentive-laden deal that, you know, he's another guy who's injured a lot. So a lot of gambles that they're taking this offseason, which, I mean, Joe Douglas, he's fighting for his job, so I get it. you got to gamble with some of these players and hope that they, they hit. Um, but in the draft, I mean, if we go receiver, I like Odunze from Washington. But realistically – I mean, we don't want to be up here. We probably won't be up here next year at 10 um, if everything goes the right way. So they should take another tackle. I would take Huaga um, or trade back. I mean, trading, trading back might be the best option for them in the draft at this point so they could recoup some picks because they lost their second-round pick because of the Aaron Rodgers trade. So maybe they, get, they move down seven slots and get a second-round pick and they're able to, you know, take maybe not the top tackle on the board, but, you know, maybe their fourth or fifth tackle at that slot in the first round and then go from there, you know, address receiver, safety. But things are looking really good right now. Um, as long as we keep Aaron Rodgers upright, I think the play calling issues won't be an issue because he'll be the one calling the shots, like – Nathaniel Hackett, he had to really coach these guys last year, and it was a, a dangerous thing to do because, you know, Zach Wilson's had the scaries the last few years, and then you bring in Tim Boyle, who he's more like a practice squad quarterback, you know, an emergency quarterback at this point. So I think this season's going to be telling. Um, I do think they should take a – quarterback, a developmental quarterback in the fourth round, third, fourth round. Let's see if Penix drops that far. I mean, if we see him dropping in the second round, I would you know, package some of those picks to go up and get him so he can sit behind Rodgers. He'll be the third string. We got Tyrod, but we need to start thinking, you know, have forward thinking with this. We can't you know, expect Rodgers is going to play three, four more years when it's I don't want to say it's a circus already, but, like, you got his name being thrown around for VP, even though, I mean, Kennedy would never win the election, but still he would have, he would have had to, you know, leave. How, how legitimate that was, we don't know. But the fact that there's always something with this guy, you got to be prepared for him to even after this season be like, yo, I'm done. I'm ready to call it quits, you know. Um, I'm moving on. And that would leave us in a terrible position because we'd be right back at square one. So I think they can't blindly 
follow Aaron Rodgers for the next some odd years. They have to, you know, build the team for what works for him, but also build this team for five years from now or 10 years from now because we've got talent. You got Sauce Gardner. I know I'm ranting. Uh, they would have, you know, played the music if this was an award show. But um, we got Sauce Gardner. We got pieces on the line, Quinnen. So we've got talent on this team. But uh, coming around as a collective this season, hopefully injuries don't come back to bite us. It seems to be the common theme every year is injuries. But if this team can stay healthy for a season, watch out. I mean, Bills lost a lot of people. Dolphins lost a lot of people. So, I mean, the Patriots aren't even, they're an afterthought at this point. I'm not worried about them. Um, but the Bills and Dolphins, those are our you know, rivals in the division. And I think with a healthy Rodgers, we can beat those teams. I mean, we beat the Bills with Zach Wilson. I mean, look what we can do with a, a guy who actually knows what he's doing behind center. That's all I got to say. It was a lot, but yeah, I'm, I'm done. On the okay. outside looking in, Greg, being a, a Giants fan, but I, but mm -hmm. being a, a fan of football in general and a student of the game, uh -huh. what would you see are some of the things that you think that the Jets need to do to become a playoff contending team again? Uh, I think the Jets need to go offensive um, tackle uh, with their first pick in the NFL draft. They need to go like Joel Alt or whoever the top guy is that's left on the board in the top – it's the top 10 pick, I'm pretty sure, uh, I believe, oh, with the top 10 pick. And the reason why I say that is because they signed the old dude. What's his, what's his name? Tyran, Tyran Smith, old as, old as hell, right? Deter constantly tearing biceps and triceps he's and all 30, that stuff. He's 33. So, he's 33. Come on, man. He, he looks he looks older. He played – and he, it's not his play. He's a great player. He's obviously been a great player. But it's it's the injuries, and so I'm I'm getting my insurance right away. I'm getting my left tackle. I'm making I'm making a strength of my football team, or what's been a weakness anyways, a strength now by getting Joel Alt, by getting whoever that top offensive tackle is in the draft, and then I go get my wide receiver in round two, or maybe even trade up in the round back and trade trade back up in the round one, or whatever you want to do to get a wide receiver to someone you love. Um, and I'm getting them later because it's the deepest wide receiver class in years, and it's a great wide receiver class. So I'm just going, that's what I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm just going to make this, I'm going to address two needs, but I'm going to really address the protection uh, protection for Aaron Rodgers because Lord knows he ain't going to be back there running around, extending plays, and, you know, he's older. You really got to make sure you keep the pocket clean for that guy um, before he, you know, gets hurt again and goes to run for vice president or president of the United States. So you really got to make sure that you keep that guy upright. And so for me, that's what I would do. Um, and I think th those two moves alone in the draft, if they do that, it, they'll be a playoff team. Because I think you'll keep Aaron Rodgers clean. You'll add another weapon to the to the fold, and Mike Williams can just be a nice fancy piece you add. And you know, you know, you could, he's a, he's a nice car. You don't got to drive that much, right? You just have, you know, maybe if you you know you want to get you see the stars move one day, you ride drive the wraith or whatever it is, whatever it's called. You got that guy in the, in, the, in the tuck, but you have your receivers, your young guys. You can get you can mix in there. Lazard obviously is very good. We know that. And what is it was let down. So you got to address receiver. You address both. But you address a top, you use a top ten pick to address, address the offensive tackle and really strengthen the offensive line, and now you've got this guy out there able to just cook and play good football and see where it takes you. But that's what I would do if, if I'm the Jets. I think it makes a lot of sense, and I, I wouldn't go receiver in that first round. I would definitely go tackle first. It's harder to find good tackles than it is to find good wide receivers, so you get more value. True. I feel now, like it's so bad. My bad, son. Go ahead. More, go ahead. More, 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 more. I feel like a trade back though, they could still get that tackle. Even if you don't get a Joe Alt, who I think still goes higher than that, or a kid from Fashanu from Penn State, mm -hmm. or Tuaga mm -hmm. from, from Oregon State. I think they could still get someone like Fotanu from Washington, who might not be as good as those guys, but he's still good. He was all Pac-12 this past season. Should be a top 20 pick. So if they're able to trade back to, like, let's say 17, 16 with a team that's looking to get up for an edge or they see a, a receiver that's falling and they want to jump over a couple teams like the Eagles did the Giants a couple years ago, maybe I see that happen. That's something that could happen. Um, and then we get more picks. But, I mean, Joe Douglas has to nail this draft. So if they stay at 10, I'm fine with it. If they get the best 
tackle at the on the board, or if all those tackles at that spot are gone, then you go best player available at that point. Like you can't. Everybody wants to go for a position, um, but sometimes you you don't want to take someone too high, which they might have done last year with Will McDonald, but we'll see this year. I mean, we're gonna count on that kid a lot to you know, pick up the slack for Bryce Huff. But um, yeah. Like now, he's good. Yeah. Now, the, the thing we've been talking about is team building and making sure you got this piece with this piece and contracts lining up and the money and players getting this. So if they get this type of contract, this means that it is reported. Bron Bron wants max money next season. He has on the table a player option of $51.4 million. Currently, AD's contract is set up is $42 million coming up and then $43 million after that year. If LeBron does want the max, I will say this. If LeBron wants the max, LeBron is never winning a ring again before he retires. Just call it quits. It's not another ring happening. Get your bag if that's what you want. But don't think you want to win a ring if he takes that max next year. I want to ask y'all, should Braun and the Lakers go for the bag or should they try to get another ring? It's <laughs> <laughs> a low. That, that is such a leading question. It's crazy, yo. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I, I think... I think with the Lakers, it's a tough situation because LeBron's obviously your best player on the roster right now, and he shouldn't be. It should be Anthony Davis, but it's not, and that's the real problem. Um, so if you want to blame anybody for the fact that they may not win another championship ever again, you want to blame Anthony Davis for that. Blame him for the fact that you know the Lakers may be looking at a future where they don't win a championship in LeBron's window. I think that's the guy to blame. But, uh, you know... I'm never going to begrudge anybody for wanting to chase money. I know LeBron obviously is a billionaire, so you can be like, you know, you want you need a max contract. I understand that. Um, he's trying to get his market value because I think if he was on the open market right now, he'd get a max deal from another team. I think he would. Um, but I think it all just depends on if the Lakers are able to pull off a trade for a young point guard or, you know, a good ascending guard in the NBA to come to the roster like a Donovan Mitchell. Or, I, I don't see that very, being very likely. Or Trey Young, we'll see um, if they can pull off a trade like that. For one of those players, I think Trey Young is about a lot more likely because we know the Hawks like Austin Reeves. Um, so you already have pieces and along with the draft capital to package for a guy like Trey Young to come on board. If they can do that, and you can pay, you can you can have Trey Young and LeBron and AD playing together, then you know, who knows? He got to get some max deal, but you, you still might get a chance to win a championship with that. With that, you know team and the construction of that team as long as you can keep some good defenders around because we know we know we know that trey young is just a walking uh turn turns turnstile for other teams but i do think the Lakers have a chance to compete if they can make that trade if they do not make a trade and do not get better in any real way um and do not add a guard and, and their, their problem is clearly at point guard in terms of their ability to score just they're not dynamic enough offensively and Dan Russell was confident as he is, and for all the great quotes he gives us, he's not dynamic enough as an offensive player. He just is not. All right? When you need a big bucket, he's he's nowhere to be found, and it's been tough. Um, I, I think he's had some moments. He's flashed, but obviously we know he's, he's not a player offensively that Trey Young is, not even close. So um, I just think that's the move for them. I think it's all in. It's all or nothing there. And if they don't get one of those guys um, get a trade, then yeah. the way I see it is, you pay him anyways because, look, he came and took your team out of irrele- out of irrelevance. You know, you guys weren't good. Um, they had nobody. We're talking about Robert Sacre. We're talking about, you know, early Lonzo Ball, just not a good team. And there was no real vision for it. Obviously, they had the young guys. They could have developed over time. And they would have eventually been good because we know Ingram and all those guys were good. They, they turned into players. Who was my autumn dudes, right? Randall, all of them. So, yeah, there was a way forward. But, you didn't have to mention Rondo. Right. That one, that one all worked out. But go ahead. <laughs> we know that's right. But um, you know, you know, with the Lakers, I just feel like 
you know, you pay him, but if he, he may not want to come back, if you guys don't make a move anyways, we'll see what happens. Like, I think this is a very interesting summer. I think everyone's kind of resigned to the fact that LeBron wants to be near his family in LA because he built a compound out there and all that stuff. But if they don't make a move to make themselves an actual championship contender, I don't think it's far fetched to think he goes somewhere else. We might get us a, a curveball this summer. We really might. Um, we, we know the Warriors, the Warriors are lurking. I know we know Steph and Brown would like to play together. I think there's smoke there. I don't know. I don't know anything, but I, I just feel like there is. So we, we just got to keep our eye out for this. Like we have to see if the Lakers to make a big move. And then, you know, then Lakers fans don't have to worry about him getting a big contract because then he won't be there anymore. And we'll see how that goes for them. <laughs> you know? So I think life without with Brown is better than life without him. But I also understand the concern of paying a guy who's aging and older. But let's be real. This guy's aging. This guy's aging like wine. He ain't. He gonna be he's gonna average 25, 5, 5, and 7 or whatever it is next year again. He's just that good. You know, he's gonna finish his year strong. We ain't we ain't talk about Michael Jordan, who aged like rotten cheese. We're talking about LeBron James. So if you want to pay the guy, you'd be justified in doing so. You know, but I understand the concern. I just feel like if you want to talk about the problem with the Lakers and why they're not gonna win an NBA championship, you should really look at the guy with the unibrow and not LeBron James. That's what don't you know I, that's that's just my advice. You know, that's me. But Miles, before you go, um, before you go, right? I set that up, asking the question, but I wholeheartedly believe and know that they will pay him because they that's the him. mo of the Lakers. The Lakers yeah. love paying aging stars because they think it's back in the seventies and they want to show all the other stars around that we take care of our stars. So LeBron, if he wants sixty million next year, he's going to get it. LeBron's gonna get his money. They did it with Kobe. They did it with other players before that. So he'll get his money. But if he gets his money, 50 million or more, that right there alone, you have 100, 101 million possibly tied up between him and the brow. Just them two right there, which doesn't leave much room for roster construction outside of that. What you think, Miles? I honestly would like for them not to extend the contract to him i mean i feel like at some point you've got to kind of move on like sure he won a chip he did that at least he can say he won a chip in la but like the injuries i mean he's been pretty healthy this year but the injuries have kind of you know been building up the last few years this team is not exactly the you know toast to the west sure they made it to the conference finals last year but He's only getting older. I just don't see it. I just think they should start preparing for the the next chapter in you know Lakers history, which this was a, a great ride. He got us a chip, but um, we can't be held hostage. Like it feels like he should night over there because he's able to make demands behind the scenes, whether that's through Rich Paul or. Um, through the media with his uh, passive aggressive quotes that he'll put out there. Um, But yeah, I feel like they've got to kind of get younger a little bit. Um, Not to say that like Bron is aging terribly, like he's playing great. Like I don't think there's ever been a 39 year old putting up the numbers that he's putting up, but at the same time, they're not winning. They're not, you know, really competing in the Western conference to the point of giving Bron that 55, 60 million a year contract that he might be up for. I mean, who knows? He'll probably make an all NBA team, which that adds even more money to his next deal. Um, And if winning was, you know, truly what he was worried about, then he would take less money. But at this point, like it's about his brand. It's about um, staying in LA. I don't think he really cares if he wins another championship or not. That's my opinion. I feel like if he did, then um, there'd be less money in his pockets and more kind of used to pay some better players to come in. Like, sure, D'Lo, that was a that was a deal. That was a nice deal that they did. Um, but could they have spent that money in free agency? Or could they maybe at some point – use those contracts to get a bigger star. I just don't know. Because then if they do get that bigger star and they trade speak on it, Miles. If they yeah, if they trade Reeves, if they trade like Reeves is like a real good building piece that you need on your team. 
and you're gonna gonna tell me that like Trey Young is the guy who's gonna come in and help me win a championship. I don't see Trey Young being that type of guy. Like, I just like he's yeah he had that magical run, and then never had it again. Never had it again. It's been like four. It's been like three four years since that magical playoff run where he's knocking off the. You know that was when Ben Simmons was afraid to shoot. That's how long ago it was. I think. COVID was, we didn't even have a vaccine. So you're expecting this guy to be, and you know, is Brown going to let him run the point? How is that even going to work? That's crazy. It's, it's, what? That's a crazy thing to say. Yo, the, uh, here, I want to say two things, because I think both things are things that people wouldn't consider. If, Le- if LeBron leaves, they don't have any draft picks. How are they getting younger? You, you're going to go in free agency and put all your chips in free agency and go pay young guys. I don't know what great young guys at the market like that that you're going to go pay to be a Laker. Now, there are going to be some good classes coming up for sure, but I just find that to be an interesting thought that, like, you, when you talk about team building, you usually do it through the draft. Mainly, free agency can, can help you out in the NBA. It just depends on if guys will want to come. So I get that. But this idea that your best player, he's still your best player in a, unequivocally. I don't think anyone can argue with that. Is going to is should take less when you paid someone who's underperforming in an Anthony Davis who consistently underperforms gets bullied by Sabonis and all that stuff and now LeBron's the focal point because he wants money because he wants his money now he's the focal point he's the he's the bane of your existence as a Laker I, I just don't get that part like that part's not computing for me it doesn't make sense you know he makes forty million Anthony Davis makes forty plus million dollars a year and he can't beat it he can't beat Demontis Sabonis. I'm just saying, and I'm just I'm pointing out one specific thing. He's had plenty of instances where he's obviously come up short. We know Anthony Davis, but if you want to talk about the problem with the Lakers, it has been Anthony Davis. It has not been LeBron James. I'm just going to be honest with you. Now, you could take less, and they could still suck. Who knows? Like, who knows? Like, Plink has made some questionable decisions in his time here. He's also made some good ones. We'd have to see. We'd have to see. But I think they – they need they needed to go in on on three stars with this roster because of just the way it's worked. I, that's kind of the way I look at it. But I understand the other side, I and mean, I understand like questioning LeBron how important winning a championship is to him. I understand that. I, I actually do. I'm not saying that's a crazy thing to say. I get it. He may feel like he's accomplished everything he's needed to. He doesn't have anything left to prove. To which I'd say you are right. I do believe that. Um, but you know. This is this is why when LeBron went to the Lakers in the first place, I said, uh, like, I don't love this. I don't love that you went to a house that Kobe built because because of this, because of this slander. You were back in Cleveland, you'd be good. You don't you don't need this. You don't need to be here. These fans, these fans, everything you do will never be enough. If he won two championships in a row back to back, we'd talk about him the same way we're talking about him now. We'd have the same conversation today. We'd still be doing it. He would still, like you said, still be like, oh, you know, he ain't Kobe. I don't really care about LeBron. I'm a Kobe fan. It's still be all the same nonsense. And you subjected yourself to that. And that's why, just to be close to family, I get it for Savannah. That's love. But I just, I just, I didn't like it when it happened. And I really don't like it now. I'm hearing the whispers. And I just want to say, again, that is your best player. He is your best player. It, it still is. Even at the, at the age of almost, he's almost 40 years old. He is your best player on your team. So who's to say more about him? Or Anthony Davis. That's all I'm saying. I, and you gave stuff up to get Anthony Davis, by the way, which is why you have no draft picks. Just saying. I agree that Anthony Davis is the problem. I don't think that can negate, negate yeah. having that conversation of the contract. So maybe I completely, and on this podcast, we've always been consistent in saying that we are fans of players getting their money. We are never team uh, GMs, team owners, we, we never rock with them. We always want the players to get their money. So if LeBron's not taking less, then somebody needs to have a conversation with AD. We need to restructure your contract, something. The money aspect, that's my concern as a Lakers fan. I'm not saying all that, oh, Kobe was would have did this. I Rest in peace, he's where he's at. LeBron. <laughs> <laughs> <Yo>. <laughs> LeBron. <laughs> LeBron and Yo. the Lakers, bro. My concern as a Lakers fan because I want to see I want to see win it again. That's why that's what I would like to see. I like to see a championship again. I'm pretty sure a Knicks fan on this screen would like to see a championship again. I'm pretty sure a Nets fan would like to see again. You know, Freddie and all them. They won before. Yeah, they won. 
I don't know if the Nets can uh, relate. You you didn't you didn't see it though. You weren't even a fetus when that joint happened. You weren't even thought of. Oh, Seventy four. <laughs> Well, when it's not when they the the peach baskets. Maybe that was when you know you were referring to. Yeah, all right. But regardless of the point, I want to see one of the game. And you know, with how the contracts is going to be set up, I don't see that happening. We ain't gonna have enough money to make any significant. We could probably get Trey Young, but then after that, they're gonna have to sign me, Greg, Rube, and Jace gonna be coming off the bench. So <laughs> I mean, because look, you look at like Tom Brady for like 15 years in New England. Sure, it, that works. That's different. But like he took a pay cut to bring in more players, bring in better players on defense, on offense to help the team win. And sure, they won. And I mean, he's the quarter. He's the greatest quarterback of all time. He, of course, he's going to make money off the field. And LeBron's the greatest basketball player of all time. He makes hundreds of millions of dollars a year out outside of basketball. So for him, like he could take less. Like it's not one of those things where it's not like I want to be respected. I want to get the money that I deserve. Like I, I'm the best player. Like you, we get that. We know you're the best player on this team and you deserve the money. But like if you truly want to win, like you're making however much money off the field Take a take maybe like twenty million. That's like it feels weird saying like take maybe twenty million because I would take twenty million <laughs> right now because that's that's a lot of money. But like for him, that's chump change. So you're telling me you really need that fifty million, like two year, like one hundred five, one ten type of deal. Man, they was talking about three years, and at forty two, he would get sixty point one million. It's so dumb, yo. Man. It's yeah, great yeah. For basketball that they, they're able to get this much money and they like negotiate these deals like Jalen Brown, five year, three hundred million dollar deal. Sure, that's great. But like at some point with this new CBA they've come out with, it's gonna be hard to build teams when you're paying so much money to one or two players. Like the way the Knicks have it set up, it's kind of like the blueprint. Like we have I mean, it's not gonna be like that for long, but you, we're paying Jalen Brunson twenty five million a year. We're paying Julius Randle twenty five million. We're paying Josh Hart. Like you, you spread it out a little more, so you have a better avenue toward building the team. Like the Celtics, at some point they're going to reach a point where Jason Tatum is going to be getting more money than Jalen Brown, and that's two huge contracts that you got to worry about each year. How are you going to pay Drew Holiday? How are you going to pay Porzingis? Derek White is going to ask for money because he's a really valuable asset to them. So, like, I don't know. I, I just – I get it from the Brown perspective of why should he take less, but, like, why shouldn't he? Like, what makes him too good to, like, not take less? Like, to you. If you really, like, if you really want to win, this is what you would do. Like, you're at the end of your career. You've proven – everything you could to us to people like Stephen a smith maybe not skip bayless so maybe you should take less so you could prove something to skip bayless but like <laughs> that's what i'm saying like he's he's gotta like think about that like if you really want to win like ad sure he's had his moments you know the bubble he was really good in the bubble since then he's been up and down injured and all that stuff and you know that. You know he's locked in. And you know, you also know if you take that huge contract, you're not going to be able to bring someone of your caliber into, you know, Lakers Nation. Like you're not going to be able to bring in a Donovan Mitchell or bring in a Trey Young to fit those contracts and have a solid bench for when they need a breather. Unless you're expecting Brown to play 48 minutes a game. AD to play 48 minutes game, Trey Young, or whoever else to play that much, you're going to need to spread that out. So we'll see. I mean, it's a conversation that's going to be had, of course, uh, in the offseason. Uh, I'm sure he's going to put out some more uh, random, obscure quotes in the media to make people think and make people, people talk on first take or get up. But 
the true avenue for him at this point should be winning. Like none of this matters. Like none of this, like make an all-star game. Like he could do that in his sleep. He could take this team to the playoffs in his sleep. But like they're gonna lose in the second round if he doesn't have a good squad around. So that's the that's the whole point of this whole money thing. And to your point, when you mentioned some of these other teams, like you said, the Celtics, Derek White is not going to take a haircut on his contract. So, (laughs) 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 so money is definitely money is a factor, man. So you got to really think about that. Everybody got to get paid. So definitely going to be thing. Greg, you want the the final words on this before we close out with some uh, some games and trivia? I was just gonna say, um, I think that if Trey Young came or they got trade, they made a trade for a big star, he'd be, probably be willing to take less. But if they didn't get a superstar, I think he wouldn't be because he realizes that they're probably cooked anyways. Crazy as it sounds. Yeah, I completely, Crazy I completely sounds. agree. Yeah, yeah. But if he doesn't see a trade time. happening, LeBron, you should ask for seventy. Cuts. You should ask for seventy million a year. Yeah, if we, if I think that's what he really. Yeah. I think we're being told half the story. That's all I'm saying. I think he probably said, hey, make a trade, and then we can talk about me adjusting my pay. But if you guys don't, and we're going to run the same situation back that we're in this year again, you better, you better pay me for this because you make it worth my time for being not with y'all here. That's what I think it is. I think that's really the reality of what it is. I think that's fair because this year is pretty painful to watch. Yeah. Pretty painful to watch with Darvin Ham coaching and this nonsense. You saw what he said last game. I'm getting too old for this, so – yeah. yeah. If I'm if I'm gonna be yeah. here on these proverbial mediocre teams and we're we're battling for the play in and we're battling for the ninth or the tenth spot with the Warriors, I need about sixty five a year. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. I'm I'm gonna need that. Closing off, cap or facts real quick. The first game of the night, cap or facts. So y'all know Hall of Famer Rick Barry, he came out and said it is insane that they don't have an MVP for the Western Conference and an MVP for the Eastern Conference. Cap or facts, there should be an MVP for both conferences. I say cap. I just feel like as a collective, they've always done this. I mean, um, it's different in like MLB where they have like an AL MVP and NL MVP. So I, I guess I see it from that perspective of like splitting it up and, but like, if you if you're a league that's always done it, um, that's how it should be. Like NFL, they do one MVP. I don't have an AFC MVP and then an NFC MVP. Like that sounds stupid. So I mean, no offense to Rick Barry, but like they they should still just keep it as is. Like there's no reason for them to split the MVP. Almost split. Yeah, it's like you're splitting the MVP in half. And being like, all right, here, you get it because you were the best over here. And then you get it because you were the best over here. Like, no, like, that's the best part of the whole MVP chase is, like, you're watching both sides of the conferences to see, like, who's who's doing what, who's um, the, the competition. Like, it was Embiid versus Jokic. So you're kind of on both sides of the conference watching, like, all right, Embiid did this. All right, let's see. What Joker does. Okay, he did that. All right. So, like, I feel like that's how it should stay. It just just keep it one. I completely agree. Have it set up like that. It kind of gives off the everybody gets a trophy vibe. It's one MVP. That's it. Not an MVP in the East. Not an MVP in the West. One MVP. It's never been like that. So, I don't even know why Rick Berry said some nonsense like that anyway, but that's either here or there. I'm going to list these records, right? You tell me who actively or who is coming in this year's draft could possibly break this record, whatever comes to mind. If you don't think anybody can break the record, just say, I don't see nobody breaking it. First, starting off with Emmitt Smith's record of 18,355 rushing yards for the career. Who can possibly break this record? As a rookie? Anybody, a, anybody active or anybody coming in? I don't see it. Not right now. Um, uh, for for a while, I thought Adrian Peterson would be able to break it because that was, I mean, 
that is the GOAT running back of my generation, at least, where you see a guy who is an unstoppable force. He's power and speed. Um, I wouldn't – I can't say Saquon because too many injuries. can't say McCaffrey, too many injuries. I mean, it's always going to be that way. Like, you just see nobody's going to have that longevity of uh, – Emmett Smith, like Frank Gore, he's pretty close. He's like second or third in rushing, but that's because he played damn near two decades in the NFL. And he was able to have, you know, a bunch of years at the end where he had 600 here or 700 there. Like, I don't think players are going to play long enough to be able to reach Emmett Smith, maybe like Bijan, but like even him, we had, he was, he was Saquon just five years you know, later, like he's the Saquon of this day and age where you're like, he's the perfect specimen for a running back, like speed, he can catch the ball, do all this stuff. But I just feel like there's just factors that are going to come. And, you know, I'm not going to say injuries, but like, that's the mo that's the worst position to play if you're playing football, because they do abuse you with touches and all this stuff. So um, I don't see anybody catching that. I mean, it's not as unreachable as Jerry Rice's record, but um, I just don't see any of these running backs these days getting to that point. Yeah, to your point, the most the most rushing yards by an active player is Derrick Henry at 9,580. So, I don't think nobody breaks it. Maybe somebody coming in, but the thing is that running back position, nobody I don't think is getting the amount of attempts that Emmitt Smith have, which also he leads in at 4,400 rushing attempts in his career. I don't think we see that ever again. And I'll say this too, Deacon, before we move on, the running back is a lot, is a lot more than just speed and athleticism and, and power. It's a lot about processing and hit, seeing the right holes and understanding what defenses are doing too. They have to read defenses too. And I don't think that, again, not to crap on Saquon on the way out, but I think when you brought up Saquon, I, I wouldn't even have brought his name up because I don't think he does a great job at it, at least early in his – I think early in his career, he was more about making guys miss, and it wasn't so much about picking the right hole and being patient. He's not Le'Veon Bill in the way that he's, like, strategic and picking the right holes and making plays like that. So I just wouldn't have picked him or brought up in this conversation because of that, the processing part of it. Maybe he's, I think he's gotten a little bit better at it, obviously. But that would be my concern um, with, with him um, in that conversation. But, yeah, I don't think anyone's breaking that record. Because we don't run the ball like that no more. It's passing me. That's that's the other factor. Um, yeah. To your point, what you just mentioned too, right? That means maybe before I say the next the next record of it, if Barry Sanders had Emma Smith's offensive line that he had with the Dallas Cowboys, Barry Sanders has the rushing record. Barry Sanders, even without the rushing record, this is one of those times where all right, we look at the numbers and oh my gosh. Emmitt Smith is the, the greatest running back ever. I still have Barry Sanders as the greatest running back ever over Emmitt Smith every single day of the week. This is not like LeBron breaking the scoring record. This is something different. Emmitt Smith has that rushing record, 4,400 attempts, and he had Hall of Fame offensive line. If Barry Sanders had that offensive line, he's breaking that record easily. He has it. And that's the other thing, too. Like, you're not going to get a guy who stays, as a running back, that is, that stays on the same team for 13 years, like Emmett Smith. Like, that's not that's not going to happen in this day and age. Like, even, who is it? Zeke, he was a top five pick. He had those great first three, four years. Once he got paid, kind of fell off a cliff. So it, it speaks to the longevity of Emmett Smith and him being, being able to do it at a consistent level that he did it. I mean... Like you said, Barry Sanders is another one who, I mean, if he had wanted to play longer, his record would have, he would have beat that record by at least a couple thousand. He might even be the first to 20,000, if we're being frank. Like he had so much left in the tank that he just, you know, he just said, I'm, I'm good. I don't need to do this anymore. I'm bigger than football. Um, but yeah, the, the the position just takes too much of a beating for anybody to get to that level. Next one. Brandon Marshall has the record for most receptions in a single game at 21. Who do you see possibly somebody beating that? 
I would have said Keenan Allen because he got pretty close last year with like 18 or something like that. But it's going to be somebody who has, like, a great rapport with their quarterback. So, I mean, let's see if Caleb – I mean, there's going to be a lot of weapons on Chicago. So maybe not Keenan Allen. But, I mean, Kelsey. Kelsey's one that could test that theory. I mean, there's been games where he's the sole option that he was looking at. Maybe, Maybe not. Michael Thomas, he was another option that at a point, maybe like six years ago, that would be a, a threat to break that record. Um, and even maybe even this year, we'll see. I mean, I, I could say Garrett Wilson um, with the Jets. I feel like him and Aaron Rodgers are going to have such a connection coming back that, I mean, we saw it in preseason. Basically, 85% of the time, he was looking his way. And he's getting fed. Kind of similar to how Devontae Adams was getting fed. So um, maybe even Marvin Harrison Jr., depending on where he goes. Like if he goes to Arizona, I think that he'll be the top dog over there. And I mean, he's good enough as is to demand targets like that. So I think Justin Jefferson Jr. could definitely be one that breaks it. Whoever is going to be that quarterback, he's going to be your best friend over in Minnesota. So I can see him one of these games, whether it's this year or next year, where we looking at it that it was 40 attempts in a, by the quarterback, 27 of them went to Justin Jefferson. I can see a game very much having like that in Minnesota. That They do have Addison over there too, but it's Justin Jefferson's team. He's going to get the lion's share of those targets, and it's a new quarterback coming into that system. Justin Jefferson is your best friend. It's not the tight end. That's not your safety blanket. Justin Jefferson is going to be a safety blanket with that Viking squad. Almost forgot St. Brown from Detroit. He's another one who, I mean, he works the slide. He works the underneath stuff. Goff looks at him an incredible amount. So I think he could be one who, I mean, he keeps getting better every year. I feel like this was his best year this year. So I think 22 catches, that's, that's nothing. Like if there's a shootout, feel like he can get close to that. All right, we ended off the show with the star bench cut, and this is based off of this year. Off of this year, what we've seen up to this point, star bench cut, Steph, Luca, SGA. Uh, I'd probably start Shea, bench Steph, and then cut Luca. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um. Uh, all right. Um. Start. Start. I'll start. <laughs> that shit. <laughs> Damn, man. Um. I'm gonna start Jay this year. We're going off this year. Start Jay. Bench Luca. Cut Steph. This year. Yeah, I don't know if that was a question. I'm I'm making my own amendment. I don't know if you no, said that. This year, based off of this year. Oh, does he okay? That makes it easier. Yeah. Start Shea, bench Luca, cut cut Steph. People start and bake because you got the bench, bench, you cut Steph yeah. Curry. Start bench years. cut based off of this year's play. Katie, Braun, Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum getting cut. I was about to say he's probably the third one. I mean, I'm starting Bron. He's getting cut. Starting Bron, benching KD, cutting Tatum. I think I would say the same. I think I start Bron and bench KD, um, and and um, I would cut Jason Tatum. Yeah, I think I would do that. Last one before we head out and end off today's show. Really good show. Really jam packed. A lot of good content in here. Make sure you subscribe, we didn't share. Even... Finish now. I want you to finish because we, we, want, we want people to subscribe, share, and do everything. Share, like, and rate and review. Go ahead. What you was about to say? We didn't even talk. We didn't even talk about the quarterbacks. We didn't even do our little like mock draft situation for the quarterbacks yet. We will do that. I'm sure as time gets closer to the draft. That's fine. It's exciting, exciting uh, stuff. Something for y'all to look forward to because it's it's been a lot of conversation. Drake may drop in. Is he a top quarterback? 
we already see that the Bears is saying Caleb Williams. So now it's like everybody else, we got to figure that out. So we will look forward to that next week. Tune in next week, next week's episode. We will definitely touch on that. Ending off the show. Star bench cut based off of this year's play. Jokic and B Victor Wembanyama. Jokic and B got hurt. From what we saw before he got hurt. From what what we saw before he. Got oh. Hurt. I mean, it's, <laughs> I guess cut Wemby. I mean, yeah. Uh, Joker, start him, and then bench Embiid. All right, all right. I'll, I give, you, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a better one, Greg. I'll give you a better, better one. I had this one as a backup one. I'll give you a better one. Star bench cut based off of this year's play. Anthony Edwards, Donovan Mitchell, Devin Booker. <laughs> that is that is that's that's good. And Donovan Mitchell got to go well off the play because even our caught injuries. So off of their play, I'm gonna go Donovan Mitchell at the at, at the one spot. Uh, Anthony Edwards in the two spot. Devin Booker at the three. That's what I would do. Off yeah. of their play, I'm high on Donovan Mitchell's play this year. I'd say the same thing. I mean, I mean, he's had to carry the load without uh, Garland for a little bit. He showed he could play make a little bit too. So, yeah, he's having a better year than most of guys. Hey, I'm going to be looking forward to see will Adam Silver take a page out of David Stern's book and suspend Grady Dick and Anthony Black for the <laughs> act that they did tonight because that was <laughs> that was egregious. <laughs> and if David Stern was alive, you know they're suspended for the rest of the season. Oh, my God. That was yeah. egregious, was- but, hey. They, they took said, the same approach. The are hilarious. They said Jalen Suggs should have been out there too. <laughs> Yo, they obviously took the oh. same approach that the bench mob takes. They stayed ready, so they didn't have to get ready. Bench mob, we wow. out. Peace. <laughs>